Welcome back to episode 11 of the World Conquest speedrun. We are now live in patch 1.7.0. Let's get back into it. We start this episode off with a new friend of sorts, a two-handed mace named El Bonco Grande. We have been lacking a weapon with reach while mounted, but El Bonco boasts 140 reach with 100 blunt damage. We will easily keep our cavalry well stocked through prisoners with this. Let's test it out by clearing this pesky bandit hideout nearby. If we leave the hideout alive, our thief will get a minus two debuff to security. Not good. El Bonco isn't the fastest weapon we own, but does nearly 200 damage with a well-placed swing. We can even hit more than one enemy in a single swing. We dispatch the bandit boss with one swipe and move on. While traveling north to check on one of our kingdom's armies, we come across this small battle. Oftentimes, the enemy AI won't be able to resist chasing a weaker party nearby, even if it means they get captured right afterwards. We let them win their battle so we can release the minor faction member and gain a massive relations boost with them. We lose zero troops, let the captured noble go, and pick up 37 troops for free. Not a bad way to start the episode. Shortly after, we see a small army led by Garyos heading straight for our companion's party. We could try to help, but they are quickly gathering strength, and without our army at hand, it's probably too risky. Fortunately, our companion party slips past to safety, and now we look to pick off enemy reinforcements trying to link up with Garyos. Archon Apis is all by himself, and you know what that means. We have the 200 perk that makes it easier to recruit nobles outside of our kingdom, so we only need three chat check passes, but have four chances to get there. We start off with the double pass and follow up with an easy 100% to finish the recruitment. We put the effort in to max our charm and raise relations with everyone, making these situations much easier. He wants just over 1 million and we have well over 6 million right now, so we take him in. The Varos clan owns two fiefs, Garantor Castle and Orticia, and have five nobles at clan tier 5. This is a solid pickup for us. Garios seems to be heading towards Rotea, so we head there to cut him off. Vasilips has made his way back here after being captured, so we take him back into the party. Once we get a break from the war, we can have him start his own party once again. We reach scouting 125. Both perks are good, but we want the movement speed bonus, so we go with Tracker. Garios starts the siege with just under 700 troops to our nearly 500 defenders. I'm not sure if the AI has gotten more brazen since the siege fixes, but I don't think this will go well for him. Not long after, one of our kingdom's armies comes strolling in from the north to break the siege. Now Garios is outnumbered by 300 troops and regrets his life decisions. Time to put El Bonco Grande to the real test. Mounted combat. Back. We can one-shot just about anyone as long as we get an accurate hit. You'll notice once our aim is off, the damage drops off sharply well below 100. To increase this, we would have to increase our handling or the weapons handling, but it works well as is for now. We set up our lines just 100 meters from the enemy to exchange volleys of arrows. The shields are proving to be quite effective here and we are burning through ammunition. However, it is suppressing the enemy from shooting back at us. We take advantage of this to pick off some of the enemy nobles. We even take out Garios. Now for the real test. Highly armored cat when our aim is true, we can hit for over a hundred still. While we're hunting cavalry, the enemy charged into our lines, so we issue a counter charge. We finished wiping the rest of their army, losing only 155 troops in the process. One thing to notice here, we have over a 4 to 1 KDR and even took enemy nobles out before the big brawl, yet they still only had two troops flee from the battle. 1.7.0 changes to morale means that troops nearly never retreat, so expect to take more casualties even in battles you are winning by a landslide. We can take up to 109 troops into our party post battle, saving us time with recruiting back to full strength. Another annoying raid. Fortunately, they were in the direction we were heading already. We lose a single troop in the scuffle. Our relations with them are quite poor, so we release them. If our relations are bad, mercenaries will refuse to work with us, which we may need in the future. Asteroid had declared war on us recently, and it's most likely because we recruited Varos, who owns land on their borders. It may have been a better idea to not recruit them, but at this point it's too late to turn back. We don't want our AI nobles to split their attention between multiple enemies, so we force a peace with Asteroid. Nobody wants peace, so we have to spend 370 influence to outvote them. Them. In an effort to finish the war quickly, we head to the nearest fief and begin the siege. Hertegea is the target here and we outnumber them by more than 2 to 1. With the new siege changes, we only need a ram and a pair of siege towers to be effective here. We spend a few minutes picking defenders off the walls before siege equipment arrive. We decide to not waste any time and head up to the tower first. 
There are no defenders when we get to the top, allowing us to flank these archers. When using a longer weapon, we have to be cautious with head-to-head -head engagements, as our weapon will not only be slower to swing, but the sweet spot is further away from us, making it harder to get solid hits on opponents that rush us. If they push forward into you, turn and run to create space. We fumble the ball pretty bad here and get starched by a two-handed sword. I guess it's payback for all the times we destroyed them with Satan's Tooth. Notice how we have troops at both siege towers as well as the main gate, all pushing forward as we want them to. We end up losing 127 troops, which is significantly less than it would normally be with the previous patch. Hertegea Castle is an important pickup for us because we want a buffer between us and potential enemies. Now, most attacks will hit Hertegea first before they move on to Rotea or Jalmaris. At this point, we don't care who gets the fief, so it will save us influence if we go with the majority decision. We spent a week or so collecting troops from our villages only to have the enemy sneak in to take Hertegea Castle back. They have only 200 troops, so the siege should be easy. One thing to note, for battles like these, we would rather the enemy have Onager than Ballista, since Onager will only injure and Ballista will both injure and kill. We may lose a ram or a siege tower to the Onager shots, but we can always reset the siege to get them back. Not much to see here, we basically steamrolled them and lost only 29 troops. The castle returns to Akios, and we push north once again to take Gersegos. The Vlandians had declared war on us and started to siege down some of Varos' fiefs, so we decide to sue for peace. It's much cheaper to pay a few dinars per day now to avoid losing the fiefs, rather than losing time and troops to take it back later. Gersegos has only 200 troops in the garrison, so it should be another trivial siege. However, these annoying rats have sieged down Hertegea Castle once more, so we rush south to defend it against a massive enemy force, only to find 160 enemy troops instead. Them. They give up on the siege and flee shortly after breaking apart into two parties. Unfortunately for them, they went the wrong way and head into a dead end. We can't recruit her and don't want to waste our time fighting in person, so we auto-resolve. Seven of ours are dead, a fair trade to save a few minutes. The second party that split off decides to raid our village right in front of us, which will slow them down from being able to escape. This time we lose only one troop. Now for the final significant holding in the area from the Western Empire, Legetta. We do have the numbers advantage here, but they are making Ballista, so we make a few trebuchet to try to deal with them. We quickly make ram and towers, and knock out all the siege engines. Now the siege should be much easier. Once again, we are up the siege tower first, and nobody is waiting to receive us. The tower to our left has a flank on all of our shielded troops, so we should neutralize that first. <laughs> We run through the defenders on the stairs and onto the roof. These Batanian archers are tough opponents and do devastating damage. They time their attacks perfectly apart, making it impossible to block everything, and we go down. Thanks to the morale change with the new patch, our troops won't run when we go down and they storm the town on all three fronts effectively. We lose even fewer troops than when we took the previous two castles. Legeta is ours, and we have no more major opposition in the area from the Western Empire. They keep going back to Hertogea Castle like a moth to a flame but we catch them before they can take it back this time. Our archer line is having a field day here, and I'm really not quite sure why. Rather than letting our melee troops slug it out, we move everyone back slowly as they approach so we can get a few more volleys off. Moving in a shield wall formation is really slowing the enemy down, blocking some of our arrows, but also allowing us to get more shots off. Time for the old square formation trick and allow our archers to continue their output from the enemy's flank.
If you thought the Manavlians were done with me, think again. This one shoves their spear right into our back and we go down. However, it's a small price to pay compared to the nearly 15 to 1 KDR we achieved in this battle. The Western Empire has mustered together all available troops they could for a last ditch effort to take Legeta back. We could fight this battle, but really there isn't much benefit if we do, so let's take a look at a peace deal. We only have to pay 80 dinars per day and we have 100% support from our nobles to do it. Done deal. Time to let everyone go from the army so they can recruit back to full strength. It's about time we spend a few weeks going to our fiefs and straightening out our build orders and setting up our future plans. Our first stop is Rotea. We need to finish off the gardens and militia grounds first, and there is enough money in reserve so we're in good shape here. Before we go, we need to spend some time getting our companion parties back in action. All four groups were destroyed and captured in the previous war, so we will need to give them some time to catch back up. We have a few of our party leader companions, and a couple are down south in Jomaris. Let's fix the building build order first and then focus on the parties next. We have both the orchard and the aqueducts completed so we will be getting maximum amount of prosperity gain from buildings. Next we look at our village production. This town has only two bound villages and they are both producing the maximum 18 food per day each, which means we don't need to worry about either of them. Once a village reaches 600 hearths or more, they will be at the max level for food contribution to the town. Keep in mind, any food that is produced above our capacity is not wasted, but is in instead turned into prosperity gain. So 30 food over the limit per day translates into 3 prosperity per day gain. Now back to our companion parties. If we start each of them off by themselves with no troops, it could take a while for them to get up to speed. So instead, we drain the garrison and recruit the town's troops to give each party a head start. We could use another intelligence focused companion to lead our parties and as luck would have it, Pera the Willow Bark is in the tavern. She only has 3 intelligence points, but also only level 10, so she has plenty of room to grow and will be a nice addition to the clan. We suit her up with some decent gear and head south to the next town. We are no longer over the party limit, so we need to pick up more troops to give to Para. We take a few troops from the garrison at Zeonica and send her on her way. Both of these towns are no longer on the front lines, making it much safer for us to drain their garrison. Looking at the town itself, we see a couple opportunities for improvement. Again, food and aqueducts are in good shape, so we look at the bound villages next. There are three here, with one producing at the lowest level, giving only plus six food, and the other two producing at the middle levels giving plus 12 food per day. We definitely need to get all of these up to plus 18 food per day. The best way to do this is to turn off all buildings and use the irrigation daily default. This will add hearth growth per day to each village. Once we reach 200 at Neocores, we will gain an extra plus 6 per day, and once all three reach 600 hearths, we will gain an extra plus 18 overall, or plus 6 from each. It will take a few hundred days to get there, so let's leave it on irrigation for now. One more thing we can do to speed up hearth growth is solving settlement issues, which is done by completing quests given by the notables. This guy only needs a few tools, which we already have in our inventory, taking the hearth growth from 0.48 per day up to 1.28 which is a massive difference. We spend a week or so clearing up issues at our other villages nearby in order to boost their hearth growth. Most of our companion parties are doing well on recruitment, which means it's time to go to war once more. But first, let's straighten out Poros since they seem to be having food issues despite not being raided or sieged in months. Looking at the food, we can immediately see why. Our orchard is max level, but all three bound villages are the lowest tier and only contributing six food per day. If even just one village bumps up to level two, we will be in the positive by plus four food per day. If we can get all three up to the max level, we will be gaining an extra plus 36 food per day. Don't underestimate village hearths. We put a few dinars in the reserves, cancel the current building, and switch over to irrigation. Looking at the three villages, we can see Canaros is only 100, but gaining 1.28 per day and will reach the next level in 78 days or less than one year. Tivia is at 180 and will reach level 2 within 15 days. And finally, Zestea is at 134 and will reach level 2 within 51 days. We need to avoid being raided and keep irrigation on until then. Our fellow nobles have called a vote to go to war, so we summon the banners to our army. We will soon be at war with...